being a teenager in the 50s involved a lot of rules. You uh, more or less went along. Uh, you had to be in school more or less on time. You had to put hand your homework in in school more or less on time. You had to be in uh, in the evenings more or less on a set schedule. Um, you were more likely to uh, be limited in your use of the car. You certainly were not likely to come from a multi-car family. So there were the, the lines were clear, certainly clearer than they were to become a decade later. But the lines were never as rigid as the generation of the 60s thought they were. Um, the, the part of the rebellion and the code of the rebellion, the rhetoric, the ideology of the rebellion uh, was to say that everything was restricted in the 60s. Uh, that you had to do whatever we were told to do in school, uh, for example. In fact, there was always negotiation that went on. Uh, being a teenager in the 50s involved negotiating around a set of regulations. So that in the small high school I went to, which had a couple of hundred students in it, uh, in central Long Island, uh, we knew that there were a group of students who didn't have to come to school on time every day. They had to come to school most days on time, but if you were a football player, you probably could get away with showing up at school late on Friday or skipping class on the Friday afternoon. If you played on the basketball team, you probably could show up uh, uh, late on days of uh, games. Um, if you were student council president, you probably did not have to check into class quite as often. So there were always a sense that while you were bounded, you were um, told how to behave, uh, in fact that there, were room, there, were, there was a realm of negotiation, and that varied a good deal. The rules of the adults were, were uh, also somewhat confused. There were certain things which seemed clear. Uh, you, if you were a daddy, you went to work some point in the morning and you showed up at some point at night. If you were a mama, you were more likely to be home uh, there after, uh, after school. Uh, there were clearly things that had to be done around the house, which were part of familial or family responsibilities. On the other hand, um, remember the 50s uh, was uh, a decade of the cha-cha. And I mean, I can recall, as I think many of my friends could recall, parents going through this outrageous uh, practice, process of learning how to, uh, to do dances, which seemed absurd to us. Uh, at the same time as that they were beginning to challenge uh, rock and roll, uh, at the same time as they were beginning to say, um, keep away from fast music, uh, they themselves, uh, particularly in suburban areas, were showing, uh, uh, were showing that they, they weren't, in some sense, obeying their own rules. Uh, they certainly were drinking. Uh, it was not uncommon to know that uh, your parents uh, drank. Uh, it was not necessarily public in the way that it later became, but, but we always knew that our parents, parents drank, even as they established a set of rules which said don't drink. It was thought of as a world, I think, in which uh, we understood that what adults said and what they did was something different. And we did the same things. Um, we said that we were in our room when we climbed out of the bedroom at night. We said we were studying when we weren't studying. We said we were uh, in class when we weren't in class. Um, now, looking back on that, uh, my children could have labeled that, my, ch my son could have labeled that hypocrisy. Uh, but but it, it wasn't seen as hypocrisy. It was seen much more as uh, a way in which um, adults tried to be adults, that is, they tried to set the rules, um, but they clearly did not live up to them. I think what happens by the end of the 50s and in the early and mid-60s is that the passion for idealism, uh, the commitment to see things um, as good and bad, civil rights is good, discrimination is bad, Vietnam War is bad, uh, protest is good, those really passionate beliefs in moral causes that occur in the 60s lead us, lead my own group, which was in college in the 60s, to look back on the 50s 
and to say that the differences between um, rules and behavior, the differences between parents saying what should be and what they did, that that was hypocrisy, as opposed to the kind of confusions of adulthood in a changing world. The strongest emotion of being a teenager in the 50s, I don't think differs all that much today, and that was um, feeling alone. Uh, feeling that how important it was to be part of a team, part of a friendship network, having a girlfriend or if you were a girl having a boyfriend. So the most powerful emotions of the 60s were, uh, of the 50s rather, the most powerful emotion of the 50s was how important it was to join something. Remember it's an era of fraternities and sororities, it's an era where high school athletics are rampant, uh, it's an era where school clubs are very, very important. There was little, in, in my high school, being a loner, being an individualist, an individualist, was not a good thing. You made it by being a member of the group, and that translated personally, I mean it certainly translated very personally for me, and I think it translated personally to the people I knew, um, that the worst sin that you could uh, commit was to be alone. Don't, don't rock the boat or don't make trouble was in fact a rule, but it was a bendable rule, and it depended upon who you were as to how far you could bend it. And so let me illustrate from my own kind of high school experience. If you were a good student, or if you were active in school activities, or if you were a, a class officer, if you played on an athletic team, don't rock the boat meant that you could get away with things. You could, things could be winked at. You could, again, be tardy. You could skip a certain number of classes. Uh, as long as you didn't go public. I mean, the difference between the 50s and the 60s was not so much not bending the rules or breaking the rules. The difference is, was whether you went public with it or not. In the 50s, the key to getting away with something was to, was to have it a, be a kind of private deal between your parents and you, between the principal and you, between your school teacher or your athletic coach and you. Uh, you were allowed to get away with things. By the 60s, the private deals begin to fall apart. And what's important about breaking the rules in the 60s is that everybody knows it. You stand up and say, I'm breaking this rule, and you better know it. In the 50s, you didn't do that. One of the things that happens when we talk about the rules in the 50s is that we think of them as being much more explicit than they were. So we list them, uh, don't rock the boat, uh, 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 listen to your parents, do well at school, dress a certain way. But the power of those rules in the 50s was precisely because they were not explicit. They were much more, they were really part of a culture. Uh, you didn't really know that you, uh, that they were the rules until you violated them, until you broke them, until you w wore the wrong thing to school. If you were a girl until your blouse was, had one button too many opened. If you were a boy, your pants were tapered too tightly uh, uh, at the, uh, uh, at your calf. So the power was not that we had a list of rules. Uh, in fact, when, when, the, when we began to make lists of rules, when we began to post on bulletin boards the rules for the school, when mommy and daddy laid out the rules of the house, that was the point they were already disappearing. That was the point they were being contested. Uh, it was when they became explicit that they really became vulnerable. The real power is that if you asked me in 1956, when I was in high school, when I was a high school freshman, what the rules were, I would have listed very, very few of them. Uh, because they were just part of, of the way we did things. When I was growing up in the 50s, uh, uh, a man named Bob Cousy was playing basketball for the Boston Celtics, and he was the first to dribble behind his back and to uh, pass the ball behind his back. Uh, he was white. Uh, in the high school teams of the 50s, you never pass behind your back. You never dribble between your legs if you were a basketball player. If you were a football player, you never went into the end zone and did a dance. Uh, you were part of a team, and you didn't hot dog it. You didn't try to bring an enormous amount of attention to yourself. 
uh, there was something very powerful in the code which said, be a member of the team, uh, play together uh, in school, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in your synagogues and churches. Um, it was only when some kids began to see that they were restricted in expressing themselves that that code begins to break down. If you want to say what was different about the 50s than what had gone on before, it's not the conformity, it's not the rules, it's the material wealth. Uh, what really made a difference, I mean, when I stood in my parents' kitchen in my home and looked around and saw my parents and saw their brothers or sisters or cousins who remained in tenement houses or tenement apartments in New York City, what really differentiated us was that we had material goods. We had a car, we had a dishwasher. The real breakthrough of the 50s was this enormous explosion of material goods in a society that had been for 20 years without those material goods. It, it's clear, as I remember it, that keeping up with the Joneses, Joneses was important, but to call keeping up with the Joneses, to use those terms, those words, is really a late 50s, 1960s reflection on it. And, and let, me, let me, I guess, talk about the ways in which you see the 50s. One way of seeing houses which look the same, buying of new Oldsmobiles every two years or new Plymouths, uh, dressing the same way, uh, getting the new electrical appliances, is to call it keeping up with the Joneses. But another way is to say, look at how fortunate many Americans were after a depression in the 1930s, after uh, serious fears for the future of the country in the 1940s, after a lack of material goods in the late 40s and early 50s, to know that you as a family could buy an electric blender, to know that you could have a dishwasher, to know that you could have a new car every two or three or four years. There was something enormously uh, rewarding, and for many, many of our parents, and I remember my own parents in particular, the achievement of doing what we later call keeping up with the Joneses instilled an enormous amount of pride in them. Uh, when my father brought home the new Plymouth that we bought, uh, he was on top of the world. The fact that there were 15 other Plymouths or Chevrolets within a two-block radius of us in the suburban community may have been appalling to a later generation. It may have been appalling to uh, commentators and social critics of the 50s, but to my father and his friends, it was a wonderful achievement. When I went to college in 1959 as a freshman, like most colleges, there were very stringent rules separating the sexes. Uh, it, it, at Columbia in 1959-60, there was an enormous debate over whether girls would be allowed into the boys' dormitories uh, on Sunday afternoons. And I don't remember the exact details, but what I do remember is that they could be allowed in boys' rooms for two hours on a Sunday afternoon, but the rule was that four feet had to be on the floor at all times, um, which meant you couldn't be in bed. Um, well, that seemed the rules seemed very, very tough, but as soon as young men and young women started marching into the dormitories, not saying we're violating the rule, but as soon as they simply 